Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Global History with Mr. Langella. So guys, last time we were here, we were talking about the Mid European Middle Ages and we mentioned how the fall, the causes of the fall of the Roman Empire had a lot of major effects on what was going on during that time period, all right? So some of the things we mentioned um, were how basically the Germanic kingdoms were attacking the outskirts of the frontiers of the Roman king of the Roman Empire and they were chipping away a lot of the land that they had once owned, right? Um, now, the reason why this occurred was because the Germanic kings were fighting against the Romans for so many years that they started to learn kind of their little tricks and their nuances that they would um, that they would uh, use against the, the Germanic kingdoms, and they started to learn their tactics. They started to learn how to combat them. Okay, so with this increase of, of conflict between the Germanic kingdoms and the Roman Empire, there was a loss of the a disruption of trade, there was downfalls of cities, and population that shifted, right? The disruption of trade uh, was being broken down because of all the different conflicts. The downfall of the cities, as in now the, those administration uh, center points, were now leaving because they were afraid of their li of losing their lives. Um, and now there was a loss of stability within, within those major cities. And then there was a shift in population, as in people were leaving the cities to go live in the farmlands of the country lands to get away from the conflicts that were emerging. And this had started the shift to the start of the Middle Ages. Now, with the Middle Ages, there was a decline in learning and a loss of common culture or common language, right? The reason why there was a decline in learning was people were now, instead of caring about learning new material, they were all just worried about living, right? That was really the most important thing they cared about. When it comes to a loss of the common language, uh, the important thing to understand is that with the Germanic kingdoms now emerging as a major force, they mixed alongside with Latin and had created new different languages like French, Spanish, and other Roman-based languages like like Italian as well, right? Um, so that's really important to understand is that th with this new common language being developed, we start to see more of the modern languages start to be made, right? Now, we already know already that there was an upheaval but st that started with the Middle Ages, as in there was m just major conflicts. There's now... Uh, battles between different kingdoms to see who's more powerful um, that starts to occur now there is a really important idea that I mentioned I highlighted last time was the difference between the Roman societies and the Germanic societies and how Roman society is usually unified by a common government or a law system while the Germanic societies are based around loyalty to a specific area or to a lord or king all right and that's was really important a shift and what we once saw before now the most important Frankish ruler in the beginning of the origins was Clovis the first right we talked about how Clovis was the leader of a specific Frankish kingdom and he had consolidated all the power of the Franks and he did this by unifying them behind a central foe which was the last remaining Roman Emperor right um, and he had killed him, he had taken over his land, and now he had unified the Franks behind his rule. Now, the last thing we mentioned before we finished was that Clovis had now unified the Franks by converting to Christianity. Now, this was important because now it's created a relationship between the Franks and, and the Christian faith, which would now continue for years to come. All right. So this is where we finished. Um, and here we... Go to the next one. So uh, Germans adopt Christianity. So we talked about how Christianity does does kind of uh, begin um, and how it basically spreads over a lot of different areas. What's important was is that the relationship between uh, the Frankish rulers and Christianity now makes the the faith spread more rapidly. All right. So missionaries actually uh, they send missionaries to help convert. Uh, Germanic and Celtic groups to now spread the, the faith even more. Um, and even on top of that, church, the church ends up building monasteries. Is, and this, these are places where monks can live and study and, and to serve God. So they educate more and more monks to kind of uh, learn the ways of, of being a Christian leader. Um, and they're trying to use this so they can spread help spread the message of God. Um, but more importantly, the Italian monk known as Benedict had written the rules to help govern uh, the uh, the life of being a religious leader, all right? Um, and his sister, Scholistica, had adapted these rules for nuns living in convents, right? So with now the emergence of creating more and more schools to help preserve and establish more religious, uh, you know, education, religion spreads into more areas. 
So I want you guys to answer this question. What role did monasteries play during this time of chaos? So with the emergence of Christianity being extreme, more, more and more popular under the Frankish kingdoms, Pope Gregory I had taken control, or also known as Gregory the Great, in 590. All right, he becomes the Pope. Now, what he does is he broadens the authority of the of the church larger than anyone has ever done before. It used to just be more of a spiritual role, and which was really important, but now it becomes a political role as well. He increases the it becomes more of a secular power, right? Which means it's more of a political power. Um and firstly, the Pope's government or the papal state becomes uh, the government of Rome. Basically, the, he rules G Rome, uh, the remains of Rome. Um, and he also uses his influence to now basically help other kingdoms control their areas. So what he does is the church actually helps uh, helps to raise money, to raise local, to raise armies, to care for the poor, and even negotiate treaties between different kingdoms. Right? He is increasing his his influence and he believes that his power is not just between Rome he thinks that it spreads through all Christians of the of the follow the same faith all right so he believes that his region doesn't just go from Italy it goes from Italy to England and from Spain to Germany and this falls under his responsibility as the leader of the Christian faith all right so he creates the strength and vision of Christendom uh yeah, Christendom. So this is the kind of the idea already said already that it's not just about one region; it's about all Christians are unified together. Um, and he uses the Frankish, kind of the Frankish influence to kind of span to fan out all of his influence over all distant churches around the world. Now this is important because this highlights the central theme of the Middle Ages, right? The Middle Ages are focused, revolved around Christianity and its battle between the state and the church because at the same time, secular leaders or kings are trying to increase their political power as well. So we started to see a, a fight between the church and the state. All right. So we mentioned already with the Franks. Now, the Franks control the largest and strongest of Europeans of Europe's main uh, many kingdoms. All right. And they uh, expand to even now parts of France. Now, we'll, we're going to talk about Charles Martel. So, firstly, the most important official in any kingdom is known as the Major Domo, right? And this is also the mayor, the mayor of the palace. So, in 719, the Major Domo was Charles Martel. He becomes the most powerful uh, king of the Franks of uh, during this time period. He actually expands the Franks' territory north, south, and east. Um, and he actually defeat one of the most his, his most important moment was defeating the Muslim Raiders at the Battle of Tours. Now the Battle of Tours guys is right here. Now the reason why this is extremely important is because the opposite Caliphate was consolidating power in Spain, right? And they were moving forward to the Battle of Tours. Now Charles Martel stops them at Tours and stops their advance, right? If he had lost this battle, the 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 Muslim Caliphate would have gained control over a good portion of the Frankish kingdoms, right? And this most likely would have ended the Middle Ages, and it would actually change the future, uh, change the present tremendously, right? Because because of of winning the Battle of Tours, the Cal Muslim Caliphate was not able to pass into Europe as thoroughly as they wanted to, which actually stops the spread of the Islamic faith within Europe, right? If he loses, this would have changed everything completely. Now, with his victory, he creates the Carolingian, or, yeah, the Car Carolingian dynasty, which is basically his family's reign now continues for many, many years, and this lasts from 751 to 987, all right? His son, Pepin, is technically the beginning, it starts this new dynasty, now, the reason why this dynasty is important is because this is the same dynasty in which Charlemagne emerges, right? Pepin dies in 768, all right? And he leaves his kingdom to his two sons, Carloman and Charles, right? Or also known as Charlemagne, all right? In 771, Carloman dies. He dies, last time I remember, he dies from a sickness, so that allows Charlemagne to now take control. Right, Charlemagne also is is a equivalent of Charles the Great, um, and he rules his kingdom. Um, his admiring secretary, a monk named Enard, had described Charlemagne's achievements. So let me read it for you. Charlemagne was the most potent 
prince with the greatest skill and success uh, in different countries during the 47 years of his reign. Great and powerful as he was, the realm of Franks, uh, as was the realm of Franks, sorry, Carl Charlemagne received from his father Pippin, he nevertheless so splend splendidly enlarged it that he almost doubled it. All right, he was basically saying he ruled so effectively, right? He had such great skill and he was so success in ruling in all the different years, uh, all those different years that he was there. And then he enlarged the empire and even close to double it. So if you want, let's take a look back at the other map. It might be a little easier for you guys to see. The purple on this map is the kingdom that was the Frank, the Franks had controlled, uh, under Pepin, right? Uh, had controlled so the purple this is all the purple that what Pepin had controlled all right before Charlemagne had entered the yellow here or the, whatever the orange here is basically the land that Charlemagne had gained all right he had gained all this yellow now I don't know about doubling the land because that that's not doesn't seem like it's a lot of doubling but he increased it by a lot right and that's really important that's why he was seen as such an incredible leader that he was able to increase the land maybe by quite a lot versus not, I don't think doubling but very very large amount of land now Charlemagne's armies reunite the western Europe and they help spread Christianity by having a unified group now by 800, Charlemagne's empire had actually been larger than the Byzantine Empire, which was pretty amazing for that time period. And he had become the most powerful king in westernized Europe. Now, a really important event for Charlemagne was that in 800, Pope Leo III, there, uh, there were actually a lot of riots within the papal state of Rome uh, that were actually going to, might have killed Pope Leo III. So Charlemagne had sent his armies to to the papal state to help defend the pope with this happening, he actually gains a lot of support from the Pope, and the Pope actually crowns him the Roman Emperor. All right. Now, this signaled a really important uh, event. Uh, it signaled the unification of three different things. It signified the unification of the Germanic power. So now, basically saying, you are the leader of the Germanic kingdoms, easily. Secondly, you have the support of the church. You unify the church together. And then lastly, it helped bring back the heritage of, of the Roman Empire, right? The Roman Empire was such a powerful force that this symbolized that Charlemagne was bringing back the Roman, uh, the Roman Empire. He leads a revival, right? With now this newfound support of the church, he now uh, try changes the kind of the mindset of what's going on of that time period. Remember, before Charlemagne took over, there was a and, and there was a lot of different kingdoms. The Frankish kingdoms were all divided, right? And in each group had a local lord that had loyalty by their vassals or their their people that lived on the land. So the important aspect that he does he firstly changes is that he cr uses his royal agents or people or people that worked in his steed right to make sure that all these local lords were abiding by his rules right there was, he was trying to stop the concept of feudalism he was basically trying to say listen you guys can have this area these areas but your power is little to nothing compared to mine Right, and the reason why was because he didn't want to have a division like the middle the, the Middle Ages had always been, where basically different kingdoms were battling out for power. He is the leader, and he wanted to show that he was leader by unifying them all under his govern uh, his governing. Right, and one of his greatest accomplishments was he tried to encourage learning throughout. Uh, the empire, right? But he himself had become very educated. He surrounded himself with English, German, Italian, and Spanish scholars to learn more and more. And he even created more monasteries than any other leader of that time period because he wanted to have more educated officials that were leading his army, right? Specifically, monasteries would help uh, kind of rearing in the new monks and priests of the time. So I want you guys to answer this question on the side. What were Charlemagne's most notable achievements? So, now that Charlemagne is getting up there in age, he ends up dying in 814. His son, Louis the Pious, uh, was a very devoted religious man. Unfortunately for him, a very ineffective leader. Right? And we've seen this a bunch of times before, where very good leaders 
emerge um, and they lead in the great golden age for their empire. But then when they when they die, they have to pass on the torch to somebody else. And that person kind of falls flat on their face. Now, Louis the Pious has three grandsons, Lothar, Charles the Bald, and Louis the German. And they end up fighting each other for the empire, right? Um the the reign of, the line of secession doesn't really go so well because when there are three sons, it gets a little fishy, right? Usually the oldest son does have the uh, the the power, but like I said, these are his grandsons, so the power kind of gets a little hazy on who should lead. They end up dividing the empire in three different kingdoms when they signed the Treaty of Verdun in 843. Now this is really important because remember. Charlemagne had ended the feudalistic system. He tried ending it by creating a central authority. When his ideas break down, there becomes a lack of strong leaders to kind of take the lead and, and create a centralized force. Now this creates the feudalism system again. It comes back. And now we start to see this in full force during the Middle Ages. All right, guys, so let's answer these next four questions. All the following resulted from the repeated invasions of the Germanic tribes that led to the fall of the Roman Empire, except number two, the leader who brought Christianity to the Franks was number three, the book of rules to be used for governing monasteries was written by, and then number six, the Treaty of Verdun ended. And then let's look at these main idea questions. How did Gregory I increase the political power of the Pope? What was the outcome of the Battle of Tours? And then what was the significance of the Pope's declaring Charlemagne Emperor? All right, guys, I want you guys to answer those questions. Um, once you are done with that, that's your homework for the day. Then make sure you answer the PowerPoint questions, and that's all you have for me. All right, guys, Langella out.